Uh, delighted to see this turnout. Uh, let me welcome you. I'm Carl Indefirth, the Wadwani Chair in U.S. India Policy Studies here at CSIS. <coughs> and I am very pleased to see all of you here this morning. Um, we're going to accelerate uh, the uh, beginning portion here because uh, Ambassador Rao on my left has another speaking engagement and she very much wants to hear the NASCOM report from Son Mittal on my right and comments by Ambassador Charles Ford on my further left. Uh, so I'm going to be um, uncharacteristically brief in my remarks. Now I know that's a big disappointment, but I will try to, to, uh, to restrain myself. Uh, let me just say a couple of remarks and then we will get to our program. Um, one is that, as many of you know, the motto for our program here at CSIS is unlocking the full potential of the U.S.-India relationship. Now, if we had decided to have a subtitle for that motto, I would have chosen uh, this, a two-way street, because both countries have so much to add to make this, uh, as President Obama has said, one of the defining partnerships of the 21st century. So with that notion of a two-way street uh, for the relationship, I can think of no better example right now than what we will be talking about this morning, which is namely investing in America contributions by the Indian IT sector. Uh, the focus of this morning's uh, discussion will be a report released by NASCOM, India's tech industry in the U.S. Now, Mr. Mittal, I would, should we go ahead and pass to Ambassador Rao the copy of the report that you have here? Uh, and I, let me get out of your way here for this. This is a ceremonial unveiling of the report with a ribbon. Um, this is sort of cutting of the ribbon, sort of opening. <laughs> and here we are. So, Thank you very much. The report is now officially uh, released. And you have a copy in front of you. And you have a copy. <laughs> you do not have ribbons. Though. The ribbon went to Ambassador Rao. So. Now with that, uh, that's quite a ceremony here. Um, I'm going to um, uh, take a page out of Fareed Zakaria's uh, GPS, which we all watch on Sunday, or many of us do, where you'll say a few remarks and then you'll say, let's get down to business. So I want to get down to business. First, I want to again welcome um, India's ambassador to the United States, Neil Obama Rao. Uh, she's had many interactions with CSIS over the years, including in her role as Foreign <coughs> Secretary, and we look forward to many more as India's ambassador here in Washington. To my right, we have NASCOM's president, Mr. Son Mittal. I want to thank you very much for traveling here from India and bringing your report to CSIS. Uh, and next to Ambassador Rao, we have Ambassador Charles Ford, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Trade Promotion at the Department of Commerce and the Director General of the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service. So we've got an all-star team here uh, to talk about this report and uh, its importance for, as I said, the two-way street uh, that our two countries have and the important economic relationship and partnership that we have. So with that, um, as I said, I'm going to um, say let's get down to business. The extensive bios for our three speakers are out here uh, at the table, as are some other handouts, which I hope if you haven't taken, you will uh, when you depart. And I'd like to turn to Ambassador Rao to uh, ask her to start off our uh, presentation. Then I will ask Mr. Mittal to speak about the report. I think he has a presentation <coughs> here, followed by Ambassador Ford with his initial reactions and comments. Um, and then we will turn to the audience. Thank you all for being here. Uh, be thinking of good questions and comments. And Ambassador Rao, again, it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, for your welcoming remarks. Uh, Mr. So Mittal and Ambassador Ford, it's a matter of great pleasure for me to be here today and to be part of this event. I'd like to thank the CSIS and NASCOM for arranging this interaction. 
And let me also commend Mr. Som Mittal and his team for persevering with, which is what is evidently their very successful effort in bringing out this comprehensive report on what the Indian IT industry in the US stands for. Today's event focuses on an extremely important domain of India's commercial linkages with US business. Let me elaborate. We are witnessing an unprecedented level of intensified economic interaction between our two countries, characterized by active dialogue mechanisms. Continuing growth in trade in goods and services that touched, in fact, around 100 billion US dollars in 2011. Higher levels of innovation driven cooperation in areas such as clean energy, agriculture, food security, and healthcare. Increasing two-way capital flows, creating new pillars of commercial growth. Growing research partnerships between Indian businesses and institutions of higher learning in the US, etc. It would be fair to assess that within this space, the Indian industry plays a defining role in shaping the direction of the overall rubric of India-US trade and economic engagement, and also the nature of bilateral policy discourse. <coughs> so where do the contributions of the Indian industry fit in, in this large concentric circle of our two-way business ties? I believe that the Indian IT industry is one of the key constituents and stakeholders in the growing India-US relationship. As the India-US strategic partnership has grown, so is the willingness of Indian IT firms to populate it with concrete commercial in underpinnings. <laughs> Sorry, I have this awful cold. <laughs> both in, and, and I'm talking of underpinnings both in the broader field of the knowledge economy and the specific area of IT and a whole range of IT enabled services. And as the NASCOM report observes, India US partnership in IT has broadly been in three areas. One, with the U.S. economy, and I will come back to this a little later. Two, with U.S. companies through contributions to competitiveness of U.S. businesses and the development of innovative products and solutions for global markets and working together to open up markets in the emerging economies. And three, with U.S. society in working with local communities to strengthen local education standards partnering to offer cost-effective health care benefits to U.S. citizens and touching the lives of, common, of the common man and the common woman, in particular the underprivileged. Most importantly, the Indian IT companies have been the bridge that has not only connected on a 24-7 basis the technology companies in Buffalo or California with their Indian partners in Bangalore and Chennai, but also have strengthened people-to-people -people contact. When one refers to economic contribution, it conjures up several notions. There are some who would perhaps measure it in dollars and cents. I would like to believe that the Indian IT businesses pursue a more holistic goal of economic contribution. The result is that the actual story of Indian IT companies in the US is different and contrary to the existing rhetoric that often emerges from some segments of uh, stakeholders. For those who talk purely of numbers, NASCOM's report and the evidence on the ground clearly points to the fact that last year, Indian technology companies have supported about 280,000 jobs, predominantly benefiting US residents contributed billions of dollars in taxes to the U.S. Treasury, increased their local hiring when many U.S. companies were downsizing, and invested over five billion U.S. dollars in M&A activities in several U.S. states. All combined, Indian businesses have invested <coughs> around 26 billion U.S. dollars in the last five years in over 43 states of the United States in a range of areas in manufacturing and services. But the contribution of the Indian IT investment in the US 
also emphasizes a multi-level and value-based ecosystem. As a result, at the level of businesses, they have made commitments to the innovation economy of the US by setting up innovation centers to drive the next generation technology development and to deliver process efficiencies. You'll find several examples of that in this report. Aimed at delivering the larger public good, they have integrated themselves with local communities through local hiring and undertaking social responsibility tasks. As part of building links with educational institutions in the US, Indian companies are visiting an ever-increasing number of US universities for campus recruitments. They are also working with schools to support education initiatives and working with foundations such as the New York Academy of Sciences, the NYAS, to train and mentor students of underprivileged communities in science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM as we call it. In one case, one of the Indian companies is also working with an individual state government in this country on training US war veterans. The Indian IT firms are globally integrated. They pioneered the global service delivery model, which allows delivery of a service to be location independent. One of the key factors that have contributed to benefits of trade and services accruing to businesses all over the world, including US companies, has been the mobility of professionals. In this regard, some of the US measures aimed at restricting movement of skilled professionals from India could be counterproductive and distort the nature of trade. Additionally, in our bilateral context, such measures could I'm afraid, alienate the very constituency that has been in the forefront of building strong policy and trade-based engagement between our two countries. The Indian IT industry is competitive and top-end. It only seeks a level playing field. I think the NASCOM report presents the facts as they are on the ground, devoid of rhetoric, and aimed at promoting bilateral ties. The extent and depth of involvement of Indian IT businesses in the US economy also clearly conveys that their partnerships are not transactional, <clears throat> rather that their commitment is long term. Indeed, the Indian industry will continue to seek technology-based partnerships and markets in the United States, both in products and <coughs> services. I also feel that this is a mutually complementary framework of ties. As I look ahead, I could say that in the India-US relationship, especially where trade and commercial ties are concerned, the Indian IT sector will continue to be a bedrock of support and a key driver of consensus. What is important for us is to avoid taking measures that restrict the mobility of skilled professionals, and hence constrain the growth in bilateral trade and services, in particular IT and IT-enabled services. It is important that both sides should commit themselves to offer all and full support to their continuing good work in the United States, allowing them to make a greater and a bigger contribution to our bilateral ties. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Rao. I, um, I have been very impressed during your still <coughs> early phase of your uh, stay here as uh, the ambassador to the United States, the, uh, the traveling that you're doing around the country. Every time I look, you have traveled to one major American city, <coughs> another state. Maybe you're trying to go to all those 43 states where there is Indian investment. And more. And more, and including the District of Columbia. I think just recently you met with uh, Mayor Vincent Gray. That's right, I did. Uh, and I think, the, uh, I think his message was that uh, Washington would like to see uh, more Indian investment in the capital. So um, thank you for your remarks. And also adding a, a, a very important addendum to the two-way street, which is a level playing field. Uh, both countries 
are looking for that level playing field. So it's an important message. I should mention, by the way, clearly, we have a camera here. This is very much on the record. If anybody had any questions of whether or not this was on the record, background, this is on the record because we want to see this event used to actually get this message out beyond Washington and the Beltway to the American people that this is a two-way street and that these, um, uh, these steps are being taken by uh, India uh, here in this country. Uh, so with that, um, Son Mittal, if you will give us uh, your presentation, which we uh, look forward to hearing. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. And Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, after the ambassador has spoken and how articulate she is, we've known this. She was our foreign secretary, and before that, we, we met her uh, when she was ambassador uh, to Beijing. So she's really represented us. But thank you very much uh, for this partnership. And we have similar partnership back in India uh, with, uh, uh, with a similar initiative that's being led by uh, ICRIER in, in India. And uh, we recently did some events there. Uh, I stand here as NASCOM. We represent uh, 1,300 members. Those members include uh, almost every tech industry uh, uh, from America. Uh, you'd be surprised we would have Boeing and every one of the banks as our members as well, besides Indian companies. So it has been uh, a way where we have been encouraging work to happen uh, across the globe, as uh, the ambassador mentioned here. Uh, I, I think uh, you have the report in with you. Uh, uh, that's just the brief report. There is uh, far more detail in the CD that's uh, accompanying the report there. But what I'm going to cover are just a few points. I think this is a good timing to be here. Uh, you know, we just had a big seminar up uh, conference in, in Mumbai where we had 1,600 delegates and about 300 of them were foreign. And I think the, the mood or the conclusion in those three days were that the business is better than the moods. And as we come here, I speak at a time where we started seeing, if you want to call them green shoots or the economy going up and jobs coming back. And I think this is a good time to be here besides the fact that you have such a great bloom of uh, cherry blossom and other flowers here. Uh, you know, over this last one year, uh, while today I present to you the outcome of what we are seeing, but we have seen large number of delegations come in to India led by governors, senators, business people, talking about uh, how U.S. is open for business, and each of them competing to saying how we should make investment in those states. So, so the things we are seeing here today is really an outcome of the work that's been happening, and we're very happy that when they come here, we, are, we get the choice, to, uh, the chance to host them as well. So what I'm going to take you through is very briefly uh, uh, some of the points that Ambassador has already made, but show you a little bit more detail. What we are presenting here is actually uh, work that we did collectively with our industry, taking the inputs from them. So it's entirely data-based, uh, data that we collected and aggregated as NASCOM. Uh, one of the things we are blessed is that at our platform, people really collaborate very well, and we are able to put something like this together. So uh, as, as the Ambassador mentioned, I think our bilateral trade is uh, increasing. It's uh, touched uh, uh, $60 billion. The uh, foreign direct investment uh, into U.S. has gone up 90% in just uh, about a year's time, and hence I think you can see. And this is coming in both as direct investment uh, in greenfield projects, <laughs> as well as uh, the ones that come in towards uh, acquisitions and, and mergers that are happening. Uh, the merchandise goods export increased by 17%. The bilateral goods in the last 20 years have seen an 8x improvement. And I think interestingly also, as was mentioned, uh, of the 15 top tech industries in India, 10 of them happen to be of US origin there. So it is truly work that we do here, as well as the work that's being done uh, back in India. Uh, here are the three areas that I think we are making contributions. One, clearly to the U.S. economy in terms of creating and supporting jobs, contributing to the economic recovery. And the economic recovery happens when there is growth. And you can fuel growth by making businesses more competitive. And of course, investing for growth itself. And we are finding that as uh, emerging markets are coming up, Right? How do U.S. businesses get competitive there? I think that's a big contribution that we make in terms of uh, the work that happens. U.S. companies, uh, they're transforming themselves, uh, you know, remaining competitive in this world where you have pressures of inflation on one hand and newer markets emerging. How do you compete in those? 
building innovative products and solutions for global markets and help entering emerging markets. So that would be what we would do in terms of working with U.S. corporations. And then, of course, the society investing in improving education standards. Uh, one of the things that we have been able to do very successfully for our own industry is to be able to skill and reskill people. And I think that's the need today of how we can do. And I think in our own small way, we are trying to bring our learnings of what we have done back in India to being able to use, whether it was uh, war veterans, as you mentioned, ma'am, versus you know what we can do at the school level to be encouraging children to take up STEM courses. And I think that whole range is where we are engaged today. And of course, uh, areas of contributing to the healthcare initiatives, and I have some examples, and of course, making uh, contributions to the underprivileged society and what you could do. I, I think it is uh, uh, in some manners about being responsible in countries where you operate. Uh, if we get into specifically on the IT tech sector, uh, we are supporting 280,000 plus jobs today. Uh, 200,000 plus jobs are for locals in U.S. supported by Indian companies. Over this last five years, there has been a 2x jump in, in this number. And also for the locals in the U.S. in the last five years, it's been a 2x jump. So uh, you know, the vector is right, and I think we see that progression happening. Uh, in terms of the contributions, both taxes paid and the contributions to the Social Security uh, is uh, in the last five years about $15 billion, but more importantly, the current run rate is in excess of $3.5 billion a year. So, you know, again, every year you're contributing to the society, and I'm not even counting what you contribute in terms of economic activity in the places where these individuals live and stay. Uh, uh, $5 billion are investments made uh, in acquisitions uh, uh, in just a very short period. And today the uh, taxes paid, as I said, the vector is uh, important. It's doubled in the last uh, five years. So why is this happening, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's happening because the nature of work, the business models today mean that this world is getting integrated. And if you have to do work, it's not that all the work can be done back from some offshore location. You need presence here. You need domain expertise. You need contextual data and information. And I think that's what is leading. So by the way, most of the jobs that you create are all high value jobs. They are people who are uh, skilled. You're bringing in that skill level, and you're bringing in your technology as well. Uh, if you look at this chart here, uh, the, the, of course, the scales are different. During this period, as uh, the unemployment was coming in, it's good to see the, way the chart go back. Through this difficult period as well, constantly, the employment that we were creating was going up, right, in an environment which was where uh, you know, jobs were getting lost. Uh, <clears throat> It is also important to note here that when we speak about the sector, while the unemployment rate overall is 9%, probably now under 9 the tech unemployment was only about 4%, which actually kind of starts bordering at uh, shortage uh, in many manners. If you also looked at the uh, unemployment, which is for college graduates, is actually 5% or less, right? So. Uh, the unemployment is in other areas, and I think hence we have to find ways and means that the whole economy comes up so that employment gets done. So it's not about you know, what we are doing and where are the jobs going. I think in this particular sector, for high-paid jobs, for educated jobs, there are still opportunities that are there. And even during the recession period, we were able to contribute to this. Today, we hire people from the market. We, we hire people from campuses. Almost every large company of ours, uh, Infosys, Wipro, TCS, HCL, all of them have uh, campus recruitment programs and, and quite a large engagement there. Uh, if, you, if you see the direct employment created, as I said, over the five years, it's become 2x. But more important is what's ahead. Uh, AG is one of our very large companies. Uh, they already have significant presence, but they, over the next two years, would add 4,000 jobs. GenPact is planning to increase its U.S. workforce for multiple positions. In fact, in their case, uh, that contextual knowledge becomes extremely important, and that's across the country. HCL plans to hire more than 1,000 local employees across the U.S. over the next 18 months, Mindtree, TCS, and of course, uh, Wipro and Infosys, both of them have put centers and are increasing. So the center that Wipro has in Atlanta and TCS in Ohio is again growing. Uh, and by the way, they are increasing their seats and investment uh, itself. So I think that's a, that's a major driver. 
the uh, if if you looked at the uh, the number of people that we support, uh, uh, the three out of every four jobs supported by Indian companies are constituted by locals in the U.S. Uh, the, the ratios that are there of 1.6 direct jobs, so you can see that if you use that uh, to 80,000 jobs that we support here. And these are across sectors, so while we created high-end jobs directly, there are many jobs that are for those services that we consume, which is also very important because that's the segment which needs to be promoted. As I said, there is already, uh, shall we say, a reasonable employment rate among those who are educated. But the other class that we support are right here, which forms into that indirect workforce that's getting supported. Uh, and, and where are these jobs coming in and where? So I think it is split. We, if you looked at these, uh, you know, dark green versus light green and lighter green, you can see that there are some places, in fact, uh, in California, Illinois, Minnesota, New Jersey, and those are the ones that are dark there. Uh, it's, it's not just one company, many companies setting up. So each of these companies are setting up multiple centers. So we are going where people live, we are going where people uh, studied or their old jobs were. So it's not about migration, but are taking the jobs to where, where they were uh, located. And you can see it's quite a good spread across the country uh, that we are saying, and many of these locations were where the jobs were actually getting lost. Uh, if, we, if we see the, uh, just these uh, few states here, 50% uh, of the jobs created were just in seven states with California leading at 13%, Texas at eight, and the other 50% is actually quite widely spread across. Uh, so we would think that as we go forward and uh, many of our activities, uh, the diversity of our locations would actually continue to increase, while there are certain areas that are concentration pieces today. Uh, I think it's important to also see that while we are speaking about uh, uh, jobs, uh, uh, what are you contributing to the exchequer? And if you see here, uh, the, the contribution by the employer and employees uh, of uh, almost $15.3 billion over the past <coughs> five years. Uh, and if you see the growth, it's, it's gone from a run rate of $1.6 million billion a year to $3.6 billion just in a five-year period. And given the fact that our industry continues to grow, uh, last year the industry grew at 16%, the U.S.-India business grew at 18 I think this vector should be continuing to see the same direction. And I think it's very heartening to see that that growth is uh, increasing. We are here today because uh, U.S. forms such an important part, and we are helping U.S. take, U.S. will and is and will continue to be the fort of technology. And I think what we are really doing is helping that technology proliferate to other countries and to other emerging markets. If that's the case, U.S. will always continue to be a very significant part for our industry uh, uh, besides many other sectors. I do know that besides IT, there are other sectors who are setting up greenfield projects here just because of the ambitions and the opportunities that Indian, Indian industry has here in U.S. Uh, uh, we, as I mentioned, uh, uh, not only hire fresh people and, and add uh, organically, but there's a lot of inorganic activity that's happening. Over this period, there were 261 acquisitions as a country that we made. There were 133 that happened in other sectors, but half of these were in our sector. Well, who are, and what are these companies? These are companies who actually are smaller. They have domain expertise. They have some very good people but they are finding it very difficult to sustain themselves given the global nature of the business. But for us, it's a win-win game because we, when we acquire them, this acquisition is not for efficiency. This is actually to be able to leverage the capabilities that these people have. And hence, we are not only able to retain all of them, but actually grow them. So in every one of these cases, what we acquired has grown. And in this, as you can see, the number of acquisitions uh, which were growing at the rate of 41% in the previous year, are, you know, the growth rate went up. I would think that uh, uh, they have added value to our sector. At the same time, I think we've been able to save a large number of jobs as we went through this. Uh, the, <coughs> you know, the, those were the numbers of employment and exchequer and, you know, what business. But I think it's also to see the kind of work that's happening. 
and the society, we are we're actually delivering to the society with the solutions that we bring in. For example, in terms of innovation, how do you develop uh, compact uh, devices on healthcare which make it efficient for the healthcare and actually can reach those who cannot afford that healthcare today. And you know, I'll show you some examples of that development work happening. In fact, they have developed devices which are affordable and uh, the doctor doesn't have to carry those devices with them and still be able to do in many of them. You can probably even see them remotely. Uh, government departments in terms of um, unemployment assistance for citizens, improving the efficiency of child support payment system, all these are very important to make what uh, President Obama and his uh, team wants to achieve in terms of being able to change the way and add to the uh, well-being of the society. Indian companies are also doing, uh, helping in many other healthcare system, assisting research organizations in, in how they uh, uh, would look at uh, faster availability of drugs to patients. In fact, many of the research that happens is to cut down the development time and cost of new drug development as well. So, uh, many, the one that I mentioned before were really uh, projects that are coming on a commercial basis and you're working, but then on the uh, corporate social responsibility side, you have healthcare programs where we are involved at a grassroots level, working with communities to improve the, uh, the healthcare system, education initiatives that uh, Ambassador Hugh had mentioned about how we're doing. As I mentioned, one of the things that we know how to do well is to skill and reskill people better. And can we bring everything that we do here and do that? By the way, uh, we we have similar roles and responsibilities back in India, where the divide is even larger. And even back in India, we would work very closely with the society to get that done. And it's only natural that we bring some of what we can do there up here in the US where uh, uh, we work. There are, of course, philanthropic initiatives that uh, we do in terms of participating with the communities. So just as some examples uh, in the healthcare uh, TCS team, uh, working with the American Heart Associations in work events, Aditya Billa team in fundraising, GenPact and actually many others. We've just picked up some examples. There are more details here where, you know, uh, in blood donation camps that you're running there and supporting charity that's happening. And of course, participation in uh, many of the things which are uh, US while it's blessed with everything good that happens, but you also have your calamities that come in through uh, tornadoes and others. And in every one of them, we have seen uh, individuals and companies participating both in terms of time and money. So we couldn't put all the examples here, but, but there are ways. And I think this is important that uh, uh, it should not restrict itself to business, but should be able to link up beyond. Uh, here, in terms of uh, uh, the education initiative itself, uh, uh, Wipro is driving Veterans Employability Initiative. and. This uh, has been very successful, uh, expected. And I think they're not only doing it to reskill them, but also offering them employment. So I think there are many people who are getting absorbed. This program alone is expected to create 400 jobs for US war veterans. Uh, in Infosys USA is driving STEM initiative where, you know, how do you encourage uh, young children to be interested in science, technology, engineering, and maths. And this is clearly one of the stated objectives of the US administration to increase that. Uh, we, uh, they have actually been working with underserved communities to do this. I have seen programs where during summer vacations, they're running special programs within the school to be showing that maths can be fun, right? And there are other jobs too, but maths could be fun. Uh, TCS is supporting education for underprivileged children, you know, distributing books, uh, getting in programs to be using technology to be able to uh, take that education initiative out. So uh, oh, overall, uh, as I would do, I would conclude that uh, we are having uh, huge progress uh, working together. Uh, I must say at the same time that India offers a huge market opportunity right now. Uh, particularly in the tech space. Uh, uh, just last week, uh, when our government announced its uh, budget for the year, uh, it was very clear that many of the social programs need to get targeted better so that we improve the efficiency of the money that we spend. And underlying each of those programs would be technology, where to reach every individual. So 250,000 villages in India get connected on broadband in the next three years. 
they get connected. Now we have 900, 900 mobile, million mobile users. And if that's the case, can uh, it's already happening, mobile money, can they get into a financial inclusion? How do we provide health care? And I think uh, US companies have an opportunity to participate in that. And I don't think we're really talking about business. If we get that program and that thing successful, then we are able to take this particular initiative out to other countries where we need it. So I think we have a, we have a lot of work to do working together. And as the ambassador mentioned, uh, right, the short-term uh, dynamics of where we are, we have our own uh, dynamics in, in, in our own politics and the way we are. Uh, but I think uh, as, as our conference in February came out, the business is better than the moods. And we hope that uh, our taking these messages across would send the right message to people to know that finally it's business that's going to create economic activity. Thank you very much. Ambassador Ford, could we turn to you for some reactions and comments? Thank you very much. And, and first of all, Ambassador Inderforth, let me congratulate CISI, CSIS and the the whole U.S.-India program that you put together. It's a remarkably important contribution to the issues that we're going to talk about today. So I wanted to thank you for the invitation, but also for the work that you're doing. As well as Madam Ambassador, um, I think the, the work that you're doing here and the message you've given this morning is so important to this uh, evolving, dynamic, very large relationship, which has enormous potential going forward, despite some of the speed bumps that we have to face in working these issues in the level playing field that we're looking to create. And the same, Mr. Patel, really. I was impressed. I've worked for 30 years now in trade promotion, trade policy work for the U.S. government uh, in Europe and Latin America principally. But the uh, tool that you put forward I find always very persuasive. Putting the facts out, explaining what it is, uh, has a whole lot to do with uh, demystifying issues or allowing you to talk about specific issues because you now are able to see the uh, work that your companies are doing here, the contributions they're making. And that's just always a good place to start the discussion. So congratulations for, for the report. Uh, very briefly, and I, I was thinking of this group, I talked to my, my former boss, who many of you might know, who returned to the private sector a few weeks ago, uh, Suresh Kumar, who had visited India many times, obviously has a whole range of relationships there, and he passes on regards for those of you that know him. Uh, I'm in this position as the acting assistant secretary because I was his deputy, and I'll, I'll be carrying this forward for a period of time uh, at the Department of Commerce, but did want to pass on his regards. The, the office that I'm heading uh, just very, very briefly, because I want to make the comments on the report, is uh, the responsible office in the Commerce Department for the promotion of U.S. exports. I think in a, in a very, very uh, useful way uh, with President Obama uh, almost a year ago announcing an initiative on foreign direct investment that's called Select USA. Uh, we are beginning to take on uh, a, a role at the federal level of helping to attract foreign investment to the U.S. And so today I'm here with a title and a position that I think traditionally you might know as the export promotion arm of the U.S. government. And I think by doing promotion, we often surface issues that the policy community has to focus on to make sure we're going in the right direction. But I did want to highlight that new evolving role uh, at the federal level with working with our states and local governments to uh, understand better the needs of foreign investors and see how we can work on some of the many issues uh, that are coming up for them. So that, that brief background. Um, I won't add, I have some numbers here. I don't think we need to do any numbers. The numbers have been laid out very, very carefully here. I, I would just make a general point that India is one of the 10 fastest growing countries investing in the U.S. Um, you've laid out the case for the numbers you have there. Uh, I believe it was last year for the first time you passed the billion dollar mark in terms of investments in the U.S. So I think with the report, we're very conscious of the fact of the growing bilateral economic trade and commercial relationship, but particularly the growing investment in, in its importance to the U.S. economy, as our investment in India is equally growing and important. So I think that's, that's one general comment. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the attention I know you're getting. I, I supervise our offices in India, and uh, they're overwhelmed with the attention from state governors and the others, but uh, we had our Under Secretary of Commerce there a few weeks ago, and, and I was just in meetings yesterday with the Secretary of Commerce, Secretary Bryson, who uh, leaves shortly to be there next week with a large business delegation, uh, three cities to stop and visit. And I'm sure you'll have many useful opportunities in that trip, both to see the opportunities in India for U.S. companies, but also to discuss the many issues that we've, I'm sure, can talk a little bit about this morning in the questions and answers. Um, I did want to just, as a comment, 
uh, mentioned that the federal role in inward investment uh, can be very helpful for some of the issues I think that you're working on is, is that as we try to support uh, your company's efforts to uh, make investments in the U.S., we obviously want to understand at the federal level what are the issues that affect that investment, how can we continue to make it uh, taken care of, how can we help it grow. And I hope in the context of the issues that we have in front of us, we can, we can work on that issue. We aren't the policy world here. We're working on a project basis to help attract that investment. But clearly, uh, understanding your interests and concerns is of great interest to us. In all candor, I, I think it's, it's no secret to this group that uh, issues that surround visas are important. Uh, issues around Social Security payments and getting things right are important. And I think uh, I welcome very much the two-way street issue. There, there are issues on the agenda in, in India that uh, American investors and trading community would like to deal with. And uh, I find the step that's been taken here today extraordinarily useful to lay out uh, a baseline, if you will, of the Indian investment in the United States, its growth, its potential, what it's contributing much more than a transaction, Madam Ambassador, as you said, but to a long-term commitment here. Uh, there's another story we're, we're not talking about because that's not the purpose today of the American investment, the American trade in India. And I know we have a very robust dialogue. Uh, Secretary Bryson will be learning about these issues more directly soon and uh, how we can, for example, on visas with our consular dialogue at the State Department, uh, how we can intensify that, how we can understand it better, how we can talk to you about issues we're facing. Uh, I don't think anyone can doubt, uh, and I hope my, my presence here in the a very modest way as a statement of how much we care about understanding each other's issues and how much we bring that commitment to work together to make sure they, uh, they are only these um, bumps in the road as we go about developing this larger relationship that's been so typical of many other relationships over the years. And uh, please understand the, the sincere commitment we have to understand the issue and see how we can work it uh, at the, the highest levels if required. So with that, maybe I, I could stop and we could take advantage of the time we have for questions. But uh, I did want to, again, congratulate well, CIS for hosting it, for its work on India. The report is extraordinary, and the message and work you're doing around the country is so vastly appreciated by all of us. Thank you so much. Um, before we start, I think we uh, need to thank Ambassador Brown for being with us. She is speaking today at the Hudson Institute on the subject of um, Indian foreign policy in the 21st century. So we look forward to, uh, to hearing what she has to say there. Um, and before she does leave, I just want to mention, uh, Ambassador Ford mentioned about Secretary Bryson's uh, trade mission. It's his first overseas trade mission um, and going to India. And I think the first in his tenure yes. as Secretary. The subject is going to be on infrastructure, the subject that we've been looking at here. And um, for those of you who are not going to be with Secretary Bryson, you can be back here on April 12th because he'll be at CSIS to talk about that trade mission and more broadly uh, his role is uh, uh, promoting uh, exports uh, around the world. So um, we look forward to having him here. So Ambassador Rowe, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, let's so give you. Ambassador another. Oh, yes. Oh, and, and no one leave here. Uh, we're just going to say thank you to the ambassador. Then we're going to have the questions and answers. So you're all locked in until the end of the event. All right, um, now let's move to hearing the comments, observations from those of you here. Um, uh, Som Mittal obviously will be here throughout. I think we have Ambassador Ford here for five or ten minutes. Um, and we have, I think, another 30 minutes for this, uh, for this event. So what I'd like to do is just start and um, uh, if you could identify yourself and your affiliation, if you wish, uh, and who you would like to address the question to. So, please. 
Uh, thank you very much. I'm Neil Ruiz from the Brookings Institution, and um, this is congratulations on this report. It's kind of timely because we're going to be releasing actually our report in June on the geography of H-1B workers in the United States that gives a spatial analysis of where um, the requests by employers and occupations are in the United States. So I guess um, one follow-up question I have is you mentioned from, to Mr. Mittal is that you mentioned that companies like Wipro, HCL, Tata, are, you know, they're trying to recruit campus recruitment in the U.S. And I'm curious to see, to understand if, are they having a hard time finding a U.S. workforce that meets their kind of needs for STEM workers or for the companies? Because like, we're interviewing a lot of companies, we notice we get this, um, this observation that many people have a hard time finding U.S. workers with the skills, even with the unemployment problem. So I was wondering if you could address that. And also, if, I was wondering if you had a statistic for, because I noticed you talked about the number of jobs that locals, you know, created by Indian companies. But if you had some statistics, because a lot of critics would, you know, of H-1B or other visa programs would talk about how, um, you know, if they're replacing U.S. workers. And I'm wondering if, if you have a stat on for every H-1B or Indian coming in, how many jobs if they're creating two jobs per? I mean, something like that. I'm just wondering if you have a statistic or you tried to do something like that. But thank you. Thank, thank you. Not the easiest of questions to answer. I have uh, some of our member companies here as well, and you know, you can surely pitch in uh, uh, to answer. So uh, I, I think there are two parts to our ability to hire, right? Uh, at the campus level, a few years back, we really had a big problem hiring uh, fresh recruits, and that was really because uh, they uh, they all wanted to work for an American company, right? And I think the own branding of our companies wasn't high enough to be able to attract them, and I think that's got changed over time. So if you today look at uh, Indian tech companies and look at how industry analysts put it, they probably competing with the best across the world, so today their names are there. And in fact, uh, uh, many of these companies did not stop at that. They, they have a very strong, robust intern program. Uh, so we actually take uh, hundreds of people across the world back to India so that they get. I think it's also becoming now uh, uh, very good for people to have uh, countries like India and China on the resume. Right, so there's an added advantage of being able to do this. But I think we still struggle to be able to pick up and uh, it's become easier from a planting perspective, but there is, we believe, still shortage. Uh, uh, we probably are able to get, uh, you know, many of the companies go to, uh, you know, 50, 60 campuses to hire just about 100 people, right? So it's, it's uh, uh, and, and we need to get better at uh, hiring those. Uh, I think we must be clear of what we are hiring for, and there are permanent jobs that are here, and those jobs, we would like to have permanent people right here. And these are domain experts, which are going to be very difficult for us to build organically. Uh, it takes time, so we need to hire people literally. We need to fire people locally here because they want to be delivering within the time zone. But that doesn't take away our need for H-1 visas or L-1 visas and so on because uh, in this new model of where you deliver from, you would need people who have done that and have subject matter expertise of that particular product to come here for a short period. And I think uh, it's also important that we distinguish between immigration and trade, right? So these people who come in are actually, in our analysis, we found that people who came on H-1B visas, their average stay was less than two years, average stay, right? Whereas you're allowed over a period of time up to six years and so. Which clearly, so I think we should be worried about net immigration uh, rather than uh, talking at a gross number. Um, you know, people movement always becomes a sensitive issue, but I think we must distinguish between uh, immigration and high skilled uh, people coming uh, to add value here. Uh, could I suggest that um, while we still have Ambassador Ford with us, he just told me, by the way, that his purpose in Parting is he actually has a meeting with Secretary Bryson to talk about the mission, uh, the trade mission to India. So we, we don't want to hold him up for that. In fact, may I present to you yeah. for him? I'll just for his own okay. and, and maybe someone would like to, maybe he would like to autograph. I see more are coming. This, this, is, so, so this is one for you and one for Secretary okay. Bryson. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, we, yes, we have. Yes, we have. More are on the way. Yes, this is. Uh, we seize our. We see our opportunities and we take them. And the Secretary Sanchez was with us uh, yes. in Mumbai and we hosted him. It was a very good Excellent. meeting. Yeah. Thank you. But as we ask questions, if there are those also for Ambassador Ford that he can comment on before he has to depart. So, uh, other questions uh, toward the end here. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador. Raghu Goyal from India Global Asia today. My question is that uh, there was a time when U.S. companies were investing and billions of dollars in China, and today China is because of uh, U.S. and U.S. Uh, investment. And that's what uh, India and Indians were hoping that U.S. investment in India will bring and do the same thing just like they did in China 30 years ago. What I'm asking you is that uh, how the uh, IT sector or Indians uh, in America, which uh, who are well to do, how can they and what uh, can they contribute to uplift India today as far as the healthcare sector is concerned or infrastructure and all that? Because so more U.S. companies can invest in India. Thank you. I'm not sure if you would have an insight or not. But you know, I think uh, uh, India and U.S. have always had a uh, very good relationship, and I think there is huge amount of investments happening. Right now, Ford is booking, putting up a very major plant, right? And I think it's because uh, the local business is uh, so high. And, uh, you know, India should never be seen as a zero-sum game. We have a pyramid in our society, and if a small percentage moves from a lower middle class to a middle class, they suddenly become. So India is about creating a market rather than uh, gaining market share. And I think that's driving. The fact that uh, 250,000 villages will get linked up on fiber, uh, Corning is putting up one of its largest plants uh, there to serve the needs of that place. So I think there is investment coming in. Just the other way around, Indian companies uh, have aspirations, and I know there are many greenfield projects that are happening. And I think this is the way of the globalized world today, that the investments happen both sides. Now, on the Indian Americans, maybe you want to. No, I was just to add to that, and it's, you're, you have the expertise in India that I, I don't directly have, but I know in talking to U.S. investors, it's kind of the other side of the issue. There's a very robust agenda because the investment is happening, and looking at your regulatory environment and other reasons that are creating market share, not market share, but market opportunities in the infrastructure and other areas, there's quite a bit of interest in that, in that piece. So I, I, I wouldn't think the impression that you have the China 30 years ago is really the world's changed a lot in that time. I could assure you that there are a lot of American investors that talk to our offices in India about coming to India and a uh, range of projects in, in, in place. Can I just uh, quickly ask, uh, what message are we sending as far as uh, billions of dollars of Indian investment in America to the Indian taxpayers and to, the, to India today? Thank you. No, I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a question of where are the investments Today, uh, as our industry has grown, uh, and by the way, we represent uh, this year we will be $80 billion in a country where uh, current account trade deficit is very high, right, and growing. Our import bills are growing. I think India needs high value add. So I don't think it's going to be about saying India for India, America for America. Those days are gone. And I think the very purpose of CSIS and us and the fact that Ambassador Ford is here is about that message. So I think if we are going to look at it in a very narrow framework, which is what we did as a country for four decades, and we know that in that four decades, we limited our growth rate to 3%. But the moment we opened it up in the 90s, in the last two decades, we have seen, and it is growth and economic growth alone, which is going to get the well-being of our people, right? Uh, that's what's going to generate employment, and that's what's going to generate enough funds for the government to invest. If I could just add to that in a non a specific way to India, U.S., I think one of the, having worked for a long time on outward U.S. investment, I would say one of the, to the point we talked about earlier, the more we can help explain to our own citizens the benefits of trade and investment, uh, the more you can get over this narrowness of, if it's over, it's a zero-sum game. Uh, I know from the trade side, um, I, I might be misstating a little bit the latest data, but uh, a third of American exports are generated by U.S. subsidiaries overseas. And so the connectivity of why that investment makes sense in a holistic way to the global economy and why it's not over there and not here is a very important conversation to have and make it as factually based as possible and less emotive about um, someone from outside. Just the very word itself sometimes raises in a range of countries of what is foreign, what's that mean? And I think uh, 
uh, these kinds of efforts like this study are very, very helpful to just make it factual, describe it, and it's a gain for India, it's a gain for the U.S. In, in the relationship, but it actually is all part of a global economy now that's not really restricted so much to bilateral trade or investment flows. I think that's just a broader point I'd make. Thank you. I'm going to have to leave at this okay. point, but uh, you appreciate much. the opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we will continue um, with uh, the discussion. Let me also suggest uh, there are a lot of people in this room that have a lot of experience uh, in this world that we're talking about, about uh, the various sectors, investment, and the rest. And I've heard a few comments already made about bumps in the road. Um, we're talking about a two-way street, but we're talking about bumps in the road. I think it'd be very helpful for those of you that have experienced these bumps in the road to identify them and also to discuss how they can be addressed. Um, I think we ought to just try to get as much out of this as we can to find ways to overcome obstacles to accelerate this. We've just heard about the, um, the fact that uh, U.S. investment in China uh, has been and continues to be uh, at a very high level. India is not at that level. The question is, what can be done to increase investment uh, both ways? Uh, and what are the bumps in the road that need to be removed? So if I could prompt that kind of discussion, please. Uh, again, please identify yourself. Yeah. My name is Sachin Gurg. I'm a student of public policy at George Mason University doing my PhD. Uh, prior to that, I was actually in the IT sector in India working for 15 years. And I would like to thank Mr. Som Mittal and his generation for helping us unlock the doors to that. The work that you did at a time when the Indian economy was really closed, it has been phenomenal. But I would just like to add to this one of the caveat that we mentioned that U.S. tech industry, Indian tech industry has paid more than $15 billion in taxes to the U.S. US Treasury. And may I add to that that actually the Indian taxpayer has also paid significantly to, for the Indian IT industry. The Indian IT budget, which came out recently, has an annex year 12, which talks about tax revenue foregone. And in the last three years, before the STP exemption was phased out, the total amount of tax exemptions that revenue foregone was $8 billion. And essentially, if, as NASCOM has repeatedly pointed out in its reports, the Indian IT sector has had a tremendous export orientation. 60% is export oriented. And back of the envelope calculation I did back in two, three years back said that the, actually the profit margins of Indian industry is trying to do locally for the same thing is almost 40 percent less than what a, the same company gets at the same billing rates for a foreign company. So I would like to, you have been talking about this, that, we, that in the U.S. companies should invest more in India, and I appreciate the fact that we need to do a lot. But what way do you think the Indian IT sector should actually start concentrating a lot more on the things to build in the Indian infrastructure <coughs> that is really needed. And I would like you honestly like your thoughts on those sort of challenges that are there, because the biggest challenge that I face in India today is going to be the large demographic dividend that we <coughs> have, which may not be converted to the real demographic dividend because of the low educational and other issues that we have. Thank you. So, uh, so you know, I, uh, I think you, you studied the tax part more deeply, and I don't think that's really something of interest, but, but it is. Uh, governments uh, and their role is to support industries and so on and I think to encourage that there would be uh, tax swaps that will come in but that's not what gets the industry I think this industry is really about picking up young changing the aspirations of the youth being able to uh, to train them uh, by the way uh, the average age of this industry is 27 years right and you know how do you do that so i think that's a big big thing uh, what it's contributed in terms of the education etc so i don't want to go about what this industry has done to the india but i think it's a very important question that you raised that if we have done this and we have the right resources for doing what we have done across the world what are we doing in india and i think uh, i you should divide any market into three categories one is the corporate world right then the other one is the government and the third one is small medium businesses as well as uh, the uh, common citizen. And I think if you look at technology, you can only reap that benefit if there is connectivity. Uh, digital world is all about connectivity. And today, uh, what we see coming ahead in the future is going to be connectivity. So to the point that you mentioned, I think today uh, the Indian tech sector is working immensely in the domestic sector. 
some of the world's largest infrastructure projects in tech are from India, right? Uh, for example, uh, when we re have to reach a subsidy, you know, of uh, a, a kerosene or a food down to the last citizen we find today, there is enormous amount of leakage and it's very inefficient, right? So the UID scheme, which is a platform where it will be targeted for an individual, uh, you know, um, having 1.2 billion people all on a common database being able to be authenticated that he's the individual, I think is one of the largest projects that's on around the world, I including the one that I spoke about of 250,000 villages getting connected. So when that happens, I think you're going to see far more ways that technology is going to make change. Forget about the business and forget about tax. I think it's about well-being of common citizens so technology today has the scope of doing it. And I think we welcome every company around the world, US in particular, to be coming and participating in this opportunity, which is unknown. It's not going to be about tweaking your processes and products to do it. It's going to be about how can we innovatively come and tap that out. Oh, you've got a microphone there. Oh. Yeah. Sadanand Hume, and I'm with the American Enterprise Institute, and I also write a column for the Wall Street Journal Asia. I have a question, Mr. Mittal, for the broader sort of economic climate in India. And I think there's been much concern, uh, in not only in the United States but elsewhere, about a couple of things. Uh, one, the economy seems to be slowing down, and that an assumption that a lot of people took for granted, including people in government, that India would manage to grow indefinitely let's say 8 or 9% is now seriously being questioned. As you know, the last quarter that growth was down to 6.1%. And along with that, there's a sense that there's something in the political economy, and particularly with the current dispensation, that may not be able to take the kind of tough decisions that need to be taken on reform. Uh, we've seen an extremely lackluster budget, for example, and we've seen a failure to pull through on reforms that most people uh, have a very wide consensus on, including, uh, including retail. So I want to give, get your sense of what you think the political economy in India is going to look like for the next two years. What are the implications for business and the private sector more broadly? And what are the implications for your industry specifically? Thank you. Well, uh, comprehensive. <laughs> it is, right, and I think it uh, addresses the issue that you talked about of hurdles. I, I think it is true. So one, you know, when you talk about the growth rate, uh, I think we have had a very significant shift in our own economy. So if you look at over four decades, and you know that uh, the pie of services, manufacturing, and agriculture went through a big shift. Today, uh, you know, services forms over 60% of our, our economy, right, where I think we need to be increasing agriculture through agriculture productivity and also be able to move the manufacturing. So I think there's a lot more to be done. But given the uncertainty in the global environment, 6.9% growth may be much lesser than the 8% that we looked at, but it is still 69 and I'm sure a lot of economies would be uh, envious of that. And uh, the, the second part is that that uh, growth is largely fueled by internal consumption, right? So it's really internal consumption driven rather than export driven. Uh, I would think that uh, 6.9 is not sustainable for us to be doing and running our programs as they are. And I think the forecast for the coming year is 7.5. But I would think unless we are coming out with the programs that you mentioned, which would take us to 8, 8.5%, I think we have trouble, right? I, I don't think we will be able to sustain our programs at that uh, uh, low level of growth. But having said that, yeah, I think we are going through a very uh, new catharsis in our political environment. Uh, it's very odd. Uh, I think it's, uh, I'll take a minute to explain this. Uh, we have a federated structure. We have central government, and then we have states. In the states, and we just had our largest state, uh, which is I'm not sure how much, how many times UK in terms of size and population, uh, uh, but uh, we had that election. 60 plus percent people voted. 20% uh, of those who voted were first time voters. More than 50% of those who voted were women, right? And they threw the incumbent government, which was supposed to be corrupt, and gave a great majority. So I think it would be taken as a great success for a political democracy side. I think the same message we are getting from various states where the elections are taking place. The problem for us is what happens in the center where all those reforms happen, because it necessarily means that we are going to have a new form of coalition politics. 
and uh, you know we don't have the government doesn't have a mandate so as you saw one house passed the bill on uh, multi brand fdi and the other house didn't and i think it was about uh, and I, I i don't mind being on record to say it i think it was irresponsible opposition and politics mm -hmm. right i think uh, uh, we can't oppose for the sake of opposition. There are many things that we must still converge, even if we had different uh, motivations uh, politically. And if we can't get that together, so I would think that in the next two years, as we head to our uh, central election in 2014, there would be new realignments, right, and a new understanding of how oppositions would have to work together. So you might oppose in a in a state, but can you collaborate together at a national level? Difficult positions to take, but I think that will be the only one. I don't think we have a choice. The Indian electorate has shown that they don't tolerate anymore. We were a very tolerant society, and I think that intolerance is increasing, which will get reflected in how voting patterns will happen in the future. So uh, I think these two years are going to be quite defining for us. Uh, the reforms that you mentioned are essential many of them, uh, but during this period, we as associations would have to work with political parties, with the government, to ensure that we are getting the right message and helping them rather than you know, only being criticizing. So we actually work very closely with the government to have many of their policies on track. May I ask that if you can find out in India how oppositions can work together, would you let us know? <laughs> <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> another common denominator in our relations. Yes, sir. Uh, one quick question. Um, you know, all the conversations that we've been having... Hey, could you, again, introduce yourself and... Yeah, I'm Kongsi. with Sinau. Um, and uh, my question is, you know, most of the discussions today has been about the business-to-business -business connect and pretty, you know, large corporations. What is NASCOM doing in terms of connecting the entrepreneurs and small businesses in, in U.S.? Uh, to leverage the you know the emerging markets in India or the you know the new opportunities in India, so if you can comment about that. Thank you. You know, actually, uh, what you mentioned is a struggle, right? And I I think we have a similar situation in our own country. Uh, as I mentioned, we have 1,300 members uh, in NASCOM, but we have 4,000 IT companies. We have a long tail. These are small companies that are there, and I think the issues for them uh, are the hordes of them, which is about. Um, um, uh, you know, funding, it's about mentoring, it's about, uh, more importantly, a marketplace. So we, we do have, uh, you know, a number of mutual delegations happening uh, where companies come in from U.S., right, or Indian companies come here, and we find those connects coming up. The only way that we can reach out, and mind you, the only, prop, only issue they have really is of market access, right? So how can they find collaborations to make this happen? So there are many... Uh, um, you know, many tools that we have provided for as NASCOM. So, for example, we have a website called eGov Reach. We are encouraging people who have very good solutions to be coming up and looking at what kind of needs are there and then tying up with someone uh, because they can't approach that market alone. So, they'll have to really find partnerships to do that, and we encourage that to happen. We've got a, uh, a website called productsmate.in, which is about products that are available and how can we partner in those. But I think a very big change is happening right now, which is cloud, right? People who have solutions to offer, it doesn't matter what brand you are, as long as you have a great solution, cloud really, really takes away and disintermediates big from the small. And I think the small companies will really gain because the market outside the Fortune 1000 in IT is going to be more than what it is in Fortune 1000 companies. Right, and I think that's the big opportunity that we all need to work. Our concern would be the way, at least some places, these discussions are happening on data security and so on, and particularly in the European environment, we all need to work together to saying that we don't disrupt this great technological move that's happening by preventing cloud from being the game changer ahead. Uh, good morning, Diane Farrell with the U.S. India Business Council, and uh, it's wonderful to hear you again, Mr. Mittal, and congratulations to you and uh, the companies who contributed to this very successful and very illustrative report. Uh, something that you said, just as a quick comment, and then I, I do have a, a question, uh, you used the phrase skill and reskill, and I think that is so incredibly apropos to the kinds of challenges that we're talking about here in the United States as we're dealing with unemployment rates uh, and also 
equally as important when you talk about some of the educational challenges that are faced in India, and yet with this great wealth of talent that you know exists there, if you can create the kind of education system that will really, as you described, sort of, you know, a rising tide raising all boats. So I think that's a particularly uh, important phrase to use as you're describing this. Um, I also note that statistically about 50 percent then of the uh, investment in the United States is coming from the tech companies who you were describing here. So we have that other 50 percent which are also very important to uh, investment here in the United States. We've been speaking with Tata as an example about opportunities to perhaps create a program uh, that would basically provide education as well as opportunity to, to some degree reaching out to uh, the SME community, for example. Uh, as a means to, number one, raise awareness of the contributions, the positive contributions that uh, Indian companies as well as companies created by Indian Americans here in the United States uh, have really uh, provided to the, the fabric of our economy. And so here you have this terrific report. Uh, we have that other 50 percent that we you know, also want to highlight in terms of contribution here to the U.S. economy, the importance to job creation and retention here in the United States. So my question for you is, if you had a slide following the thank you slide that's behind you, it would probably say next steps. And I'd love to know what your, say, two or three top priorities are in terms of turning excellent information uh, into specific and positive action. Thank, thank you. you. So it's, a, it's probably a feedback to us, and we should take that. But I do know that there is work happening on the other side as well with uh, our uh, other uh, sister trade associations like FIKI and CII, right? And this is one matter where we had more subject matter expertise. And I would say also, you know, our industry, while it contributes what it does, uh, gets to be on the highlight news on outsourcing and so on. So I thought it was very relevant because we are talking about highly skilled jobs here, uh, even though as others are available. So, but I take your feedback. I think uh, uh, these reports, uh, uh, are, are not one time, right? Uh, they, they are, they're supposed to have, they're organic in many ways, and I think we'll build on this. Uh, at this point of time, I think it's more important that both of both sides, and businesses in particular, work with their respective, respective governments to take away the negativism. Because at the end of it, you know, business is not a bad word, right? Business is the one that's led, but there are always these issues about business being positioned as always being uh, on the receiving end of the governments, right? Whether it was budgets or any other. So I think we'll work on that. To the point of skilling and reskilling that you mentioned, uh, uh, technology is going to play, while a positive role, technology also disrupts jobs, right? Uh, if you talk about uh, Manufacturing productivity it just means there is more innovation happening there, which means you're doing lesser, more with less. And hence, people who come out of that, the, there are enough new needs that come up, and we have to ensure that those people get reskilled, right? And we in our sector have seen this because during a, during a journey of an engineer's life, right, technology disruptions are happening probably every two years. And hence, it becomes very important for us to just keep them reskilled all the time. The next steps? Well, <laughs> you, you know, the, the uh, next steps from uh, is, again, getting the uh, hard data out and evidence out so that we move from uh, sometimes the political rhetoric mm -hmm. starts converting into what people start believing. I'm sure if I say the same thing 10 times over, even if it was a lie, I start believing it to be the truth. Right, and I think uh, we all the time have to come and say what are the facts and where they are. Right, at the end of it, we are talking about two nations who have similar values. We are democracies and so on. And I think we have to remove the hurdles. I think India has a lot of things to do. Right, we uh, represent free trade. Right, and I think uh, we work as hard in opening up India as an economy as we would come and present our case or what things we need to do. Um, uh, I, I think more dialogues, more exchanges, more visits by secretaries and so on, I think helps in removing. But I'll appreciate if there is any suggestion advice to us. Uh, we'll surely put it in our agenda. Yeah, Melody? Well, I think um, one of the things that I have been doing is
mention in, this in the same regard that uh, when we had Foreign Secretary Mathai here several weeks ago, in his remarks he talked about the economic partnership at the top of the priorities in terms of the U.S.-India relationship. And he referred to the bilateral investment treaty and he referred to the need to get beyond BIT. And that is something that we are going to start looking here. We have a new member of our team, Matt Stokes, from the State Department, who will be doing uh, a five-month look at the question of bid and beyond to look at not only what are the obstacles to moving forward with a bilateral investment treaty, but also looking, as Secretary Mathai also mentioned, uh, a SEPA, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, and at some point looking toward down the road uh, to a free trade agreement. So in terms of where the question of the two-way street and investment goes, we're going to be taking a, a uh, close look at that in the months ahead. We hope that those of you here interested in that will uh, work with us, contribute, uh, and be in touch with Matt. Give him your ideas. And you know, I just wanted to comment that and taking on from LA and uh, what you had mentioned. And, uh, you know, the, the need for all of us as business and trade associations to build trust with our respective governments is extremely high at this point of time, right? And that tr trust can only be built by our bringing in suggestions and solutions rather than objections to government policies. Uh, uh, you know, where businesses and what dynamics are, right, are always ahead of how governments think. And I, I don't mean any disrespect to people in the government. They're all smart people, right? But at the same time, I think for every issue that gets raised, we need to find a solution for them. Uh, most of the time, we land up only raising concerns. And I think that does not help in building that trust that's so important. People are only going to listen to us if we are coming with solutions and we are building that trust. right? And I think uh, as one big action point, if there was, uh, that is what probably we all need to do more. Well, I think, uh, Don, last question. Um, last question. Please. Okay. I was about to say that we want to end on time, but we will have a quick question. Yeah, Don, very do you good want question. to make a comment? Yeah, Vinod Jain. I'm from the India-US World Affairs Institute and from the University of Maryland. Uh, you know, I've been doing some research on uh, how American companies are doing research and development in India, IT companies especially. And this is very different from the typical uh, low-cost offshoring. They're going after talent. And what I found that companies like Google now have several projects in India where the team leadership is based in India. And the team is based all over the world, including Silicon Valley. Now, one of the things I found was, uh, I'm talking to the head of R&D at IBM, Bangalore, that uh, the team that works in a project, global team, the team members from the United States would be in their 40s and 50s. And their colleagues in India would be, you mentioned the average age is 27, in the 20s. And that gives a, quite a bit of uh, concern to the American team members. So is this uh, something which NASCOM has looked at or thought about? Yeah, so I, I think it is clear that uh, uh, given the nature of the work, the uh, profile of the b teams is going to be a pyramid. Right, there's going to be people in the middle. Right, there's going to be more senior people, but there is volume. I today I would say that you know th th there was a time I think uh, where age played but a big criteria. But if today technology is what it is, then believe me, you know I'm not the one with my gray hair or no hair, right, to be saying how easily I am adapting to technology. And I think these are the kids who are innovative. Right, uh, they are, I think we have to tap. Our biggest problem is not going to be what age they are. How are we going to tap their energy? Right. Uh, I, I would think it is our uh, people who are at my age. It is their uh, vulnerabilities and and so on, which is creating that issue. Yes. But the question is, are they delivering? And I think the answer is a big, big yes. These are the people who should we should all be backing, right, and supporting. Because today we struggle to be able to use their energy, right? So I think it's really positive in my opinion. I know, Dr. Jain, you were recently with the governor there as yes. part of one of the delegations. And I think, uh, you know, you, you did a great job by visiting uh, all these cities that went there. But I think today the power is in the youth. And if we did not capture that, if we did not train our, um, our, our schemes and our thinking way to be tapping that resource, 
given particularly the changes that are happening in the demographics, it's scary, right? Uh, let me give you an example. I'm sorry, uh, they're grazing here. In China, right, we all know, not sorry, in Japan, we all know that there is a negative population growth today, right? And young people in Japan have declared tech jobs to be negative. Not paying long hours, not sexy, da 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 da, right? So Japan, for whom innovation is so important, right? Uh, that that's the view. So I think Japanese would have to go embrace this youth and saying, fine, I think you have opportunities in finance, in media, and wherever else, but we need you to work in technology, or then tap young resources that are there anywhere else in the world. Right. Last question from uh, Donald Camp, um, who I would like, actually this gives me an opportunity to say. Uh, Don, a distinguished career foreign service officer, um, now retired, but never retired if you're in the foreign service, <laughs> and he is now a uh, non-resident senior associate of CSIS. So, Don, uh, final question to you. Sure, thank you, and I'm loath to keep people after 11:30, but I'll, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to say, uh, Mr. Mithil, this is a this report is a great contribution to the debate, uh, the issue debate in this country on jobs and. Uh, you alluded, you talked about Amer Indian politics. This is an electoral year in the United States. I would argue that the, the issue for all of us is not so much our governments, but our political class, if you will. And the issue will be joined in the election campaign this year and on Capitol Hill uh, as to the job situation. You've made a great case. The case needs to be made on Capitol Hill as well as with the governments of both our countries. And I guess my question would be, are you thinking of political outreach as well as uh, in addition to this report? Well, you know, if you saw my uh, slides, they had the US map on it, and it talked about the states which are greener than the other states, and we are surely going to be tapping onto those dark green states this visit, right? So we are meeting up with them uh, and in taking our story out. But you know, we know we can't do it alone. Uh, we also know that when we speak, right, people say, why? So we want CSIS to do that for us as well, and many of you in this room. So I do hope that, uh, you know, our, our case has been uh, convincing enough for you, and we do hope that this message in the interest of uh, both our countries, you would help us take it as well. Well, it's a very timely subject. When I was in India just um, three weeks ago, I was looking at the Economic Times, and it had this large article, Here's How India Inc. Insources Jobs to America, and it began by saying, Indian companies are job-eating villains in U.S. political rhetoric. The reality is that India Inc.'s local hires in America are rapidly rising. So um, this is an important story to get out. Um, we will certainly be a part of that. But we also want to be a part of how to turn this, if you will, this two-way street into a superhighway. <laughs> we, we've, we've got a lot of work to do. There we go. And we've got to make sure there's a level, level playing field, that the, uh, the bumps in the road are repaired. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do, and I'm, I'm glad, so glad you and your colleagues were here uh, with us this morning. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.